Friday, August 18th. For mom, the move from Texas to Florida was a military operation, like the many moves she had made as a child. We had our orders, we had our supplies, we had a timetable. If it had been necessary to do so, we would have driven the 800 miles from our old house to our new house straight through without stopping at all. We would have refueled the Volvo while hurtling along at 75 miles per hour next to a moving convoy refueling truck. Fortunately, this wasn't necessary. Mom had calculated that we could leave at 6 a.m. Central Daylight Time, stop three times at 20 minutes per stop, and still arrive at our destination at 9 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. I guess that's challenging if you're the driver. It's pretty boring if you're just sitting there. So I slept on and off until in the early evening, we turned off Interstate 10 somewhere in Western Florida. The scenery was not what I had expected at all, and I stared out the window, fascinated by it. We passed mile after mile of green fields overflowing with tomatoes and onions and watermelons. I suddenly had this crazy feeling like I wanted to bolt from the car and run through the fields until I couldn't run anymore. I said to mom, this is Florida? This is what it looks like? Mom laughed, yeah. What did you think it looked like? I don't know, a beach with a 50-story condo on it? Well, it looks like that too. Florida's a huge place. We'll be living in an area that's more like this one. There are still a lot of farms around. What do they grow? I bet they grow tangerines. No, not too many, not any more. This is too far north for citrus trees. Every few years, they get a deep freeze that wipes them all out. Most of the citrus growers have sold off their land to developers. Yeah? And what do the developers do with it? Well, they develop it. They plan communities with nice houses and schools and industrial parks. They create jobs, construction jobs, teaching jobs, civil engineering jobs like your father's. But once we got farther south and crossed into Tangerine County, we did start to see groves of citrus trees. And they were an amazing sight. They were perfect. Thousands upon thousands of trees in the red glow of sundown, perfectly shaped and perfectly aligned, vertically and horizontally, like squares in a million square grid. Mom pointed, look, here comes the first industrial park. I looked up ahead and saw the highway curve off left and right into spiral exit ramps like ram's horns. Low white buildings with black windows stretched out in both directions. They were all identical. Mom said, there's our exit right up there. I looked ahead another quarter mile and saw another pair of spiral ramps, but I couldn't see much else. A fine brown dust was now blowing across the highway, drifting like snow against the shoulders and swirling up into the air. We turned off Route 27, spiraled around the ram's horns and headed east. Suddenly, the fine, br fine brown dirt became mixed with thick black smoke. Mom said, good heavens, look at that. I looked to where she was pointing, up to the left, out in the field, and my heart sank. The black smoke was pouring from a huge bonfire of trees, citrus trees. I said, why are they doing that? Why are they just burning them up to clear the land? Well, why don't they build houses out of them or homeless shelters or something? Mom shook her head. I don't think they can build with them. I don't think those trees have any use other than for fruit, she smiled. You never hear people bragging that their dining room set is solid grapefruit, do you? I didn't smile back. Mom pointed to the right and said, there's another one. Sure enough, same size, same flames, licking up the sides, same smoke billowing out. It was like a Texas football bonfire, but nobody was dancing around it and nobody was celebrating anything. Then, in an instant, in the blink of an eye, we crossed over from this wasteland into a place carpeted with green grass with trees along both sides of the road and flower beds running down the middle of a median strip. We could see the roofs of big, expensive houses peeking up over the landscaping. Mom said, this is where the developments begin. This one is called the Manors of Coventry. Aren't they beautiful? Ours is a little farther in. We went past the villas at Versailles, which, if anything, looked more look even more expensive. Then we saw a high gray wall and a series of wrought iron letters that spelled out Lake Windsor Downs. We passed iron gates and a pond of some kind. Then we made a couple of turns and pulled into a wide driveway. Mom announced, this is it. This is our house. It was big, two stories high and very white, with aqua trim like a Miami Dolphins football helmet. A new wooden fence ran around both sides to the back where it met up with the high gray wall. The wall apparently surrounded the entire development. The garage door opened up with a smooth mechanical hum. Dad was standing in there with his arms open. He called out, Perfect timing, you two! The pizzas got here five minutes ago. Mom and I climbed out of the car, stiff and hungry. Dad came outside, clicking the garage door closed. He put an arm around each of us and guided us toward the front, saying, Let's do this the right way, huh? Let's go in the visitor's door. Dad led us through the front door into a tiled foyer two stories high. We turned to the left and passed through an enormous great room of furniture and boxes piled all around it. 
We ended up in an area off the kitchen that had a small round table and four chairs. Eric was sitting in one of the chairs. He waved casually to mom. He ignored me. Mom waved back at him, but she was looking at the boxes stacked in the kitchen. She said to dad, these boxes are marked dining room. Dad said, "Uh uh-huh. Uh Uh-huh. Well, I marked dining room on them so the movers would put them in the dining room. Okay. Eric will put them over there. He looked at me and added, Eric and Paul. Mom asked, did the movers break anything? No, they didn't break a thing. They were real pros. Nice guys, too. Mom and I each grabbed a chair. Eric opened a pizza box, pulled out a slice, and started stuffing it into his mouth. Mom said, how about waiting for the rest of us, Eric? He gave her a tomatoey grin. Dad passed out paper plates, napkins, and cans of soda. Once Dad sat down, the rest of us started to eat. Everybody's mouth was full for a minute, then Mom said to Dad, So, what have you been doing? Dad wiped his mouth. Work? Trying to get organized up there. Trying to get in to see old Charlie Burns. He looked at me. He's a real character. You'll have to meet him. Spends half his life at the stock car races. He's crazy about stock car racing. Mom said, You mean he's he's really not there? You can't get in to see him because he's not there? Right. He's really not there. He's up at Darlington or at Talladega or at Daytona. Mom was concerned, and that's okay. I don't know that it's okay, but that's the way it is. He's the boss. He makes his own hours. He told me I can make my own hours too. He looked over at Eric. That'll be good for us. I'll be able to go to football practice every day. I thought to myself, okay, here we are. How long did it take Dad to get to his favorite topic, the Eric Fisher football dream? I'd heard it all before, too many times, and I was about to hear it again. I tried to head him off by asking him something, anything, but he was too fast for me. It's a great opportunity for you boys, too. Eric will get the exposure he needs in the press. The Tangerine Times is crazy about high school football. And we're just down the road from the University of Florida, you know, the Gators. In fact, old Charlie is a big Gators fan. And Florida State and the University of Miami aren't far away. Three big-time Florida schools like to drive Florida boys for their teams. That was that. Dad was now off into the Eric Fisher football dream. As soon as I got an opening, I said, may I be excused? I'd like to go find my bedroom. Dad said, sure thing. You're at the top of the stairs to the right. Eric's down at the other end. And you have the two guest rooms in between. You guys should never hear each other. I retraced my steps through the great room, went up the stairs, and turned right. I had to squeeze into my bedroom past the stack of boxes. I switched on the light and saw one that had Paul sheets written on it. So I opened it and made up my bed. Then I found my computer carton and set it up on the desk. When I got around to putting my clothes away in the dresser, I came across the box that said Eric's trophies. I felt a surge of anger, mom's anger, at the moving guys for doing that. I picked it up and carried it out to the top of the stairs. Eric was standing down in the foyer. He had the front door cracked open. He was talking to a group of kids, at least two girls and one guy, telling them that he would see them later. I put the box down quietly and hurried back into my room. I turned on the computer, got into my private journal, and wrote until about 11 o'clock. Then I lay down on the bed and fell asleep, but I woke up almost immediately. Someone was running down the hall. It was Eric. I heard him run down the stairs, go out the front door, and pull away in a loud car. I couldn't get back to sleep. My mind started racing like an engine. I started thinking about our old house. Then I started thinking about a zombie, a pissed off zombie, dragging one foot behind him, keeping to the right, taking his time, slowly, surely, stalking his way down Interstate 10.